Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception, and we are here continuing with the narrative in the Gospel of John about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And last time, we covered the resurrection itself with them finding the empty tomb. And the way that section ends, we'll just read the last couple verses. Then the other disciple, and that's John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they had not, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So the disciples, Peter and John, they leave. They go back home, and the text, the narrative, continues. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Now, in this teaching today, we're going to cover these three appearances, really, of Jesus, his encounters with his disciples, the one with the disciples in the upper room, and then a week later with Thomas. We're going to cover all of that today because there are interesting contrasts that we, that we see here. But again, we have this challenge of reading a text that is so familiar to us. And we need to trick our minds, do a little bit of of creative thinking, and pretend that this is not familiar to us, that we're reading it for the first time. And when we do that, one of the things that stands out, the disciples left. Peter, John, they left. Who stayed? Mary Magdalene stayed. That's interesting because Mary Magdalene, and the text makes this clear, she was seeking Jesus. Now, she didn't understand what had really transpired. None of them really did. It does say that Peter and John believed, but they did not yet understand. So, we've got that going on. But Mary stays there. And and what is her express purpose for staying there? She thinks Jesus' body has been taken away, either in desecration of his tomb by the opposition, possibly, because he'd been buried in someone else's tomb. It was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea in which he had been lain. So, all these possibilities are going through her mind. All she knows is he's not there. And it's Mary, and I think this is key, it's Mary who stays. It's Mary who is seeking Jesus, perhaps in a not fully informed way, but still, she's seeking Jesus, and it is Mary to whom the angels appear. So, she went in and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Here we have this disconnect between the perspective of the heavenly host, the angels, understanding exactly what is going on, 
this is something to be celebrated. This is the angels in heaven are singing God's victory song over sin, death, hell, and Satan. And this woman is weeping. And so their perspective is, why are you weeping? You've got the wrong attitude on this. Now, she had the wrong attitude because she didn't understand. But still, the disconnect between the victory that had taken place, the celebration that was going on, and the human response to that. The angels are baffled. It's not just a question. It's not just a throwaway line. They want to know why she is weeping. And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And and we hear her suffering, her sorrow. She'd already lost her Lord, crucified. And now, To her mind, apparently, the tomb has been desecrated, his body's been taken out and just thrown somewhere for all she knows. And we all know that when you're in a bad spot, when you're struggling, when there is a great emotional burden on you, your mind doesn't go to the best outcome. Your mind goes to the worst outcome. But having said this, she turns around and Jesus is standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Why? She wasn't expecting Jesus. She may well have not even looked him in the face because Jesus was dead. And and she hasn't caught on to all of this yet. She thinks he's the gardener. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Same question as the angels. There is no place for weeping. And, and, and I think we might even say this in a broader context. On this side of the resurrection, that moment in history, that watershed event of all history, there is no place for weeping, true weeping, that weeping that comes from loss. Yeah, we weep, but we don't weep and mourn as those who have no hope, as Paul tells the Thessalonians many years later. But woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Again, that concept, that idea, that thought that Mary is seeking Jesus. The other disciples have to wait 12 or more hours until they get to see Jesus. They're in the upper room. Mary gets to see him first because Mary is seeking Jesus. And and there's an important message to us in that. The most important thing we can do is to seek Jesus, to pursue him. And that means not like he's out somewhere and we're looking for him, but to seek to draw closer to him, to to seek to know him better, his will better, his plan more fully. And we do that by being in the word. That's why we're here doing what we're doing at decoding the deception, teaching the word of God, putting it out there for people to hear. But it's also something that we do individually in our own time in the word that the Lord can bring us closer to him, have a greater understanding of him. And our prayer life as well is an important part of that, but it is a personal seeking of our Savior. And as misguided as what Mary was doing may have been with everything that we know, she was doing the right thing. She was seeking him. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. She was going to pick him up and and take him somewhere to give him a decent burial. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And with that, she recognizes him. And she turned. See, she was hadn't been looking directly at him. He wasn't a key player here in her mind. She was just seeking information and, and in grief probably wasn't even looking up. But she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And and I don't frankly, I just don't get this. It's it's teacher, but it's my teacher, Rabboni, and, and people then would have known it anyway. But 
Rabboni, the I on the end of that term from which we get rabbi, Rabboni means my teacher. My teacher is a, a personal connection. It's not just acknowledging that someone is a teacher, but acknowledging that they're your teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. So apparently she had embraced him. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So what's this about? Don't cling to me. What's the point? What is it that Jesus is saying? As much as he is happy that he's comforting Mary and that she has that peace that comes from that and that she was seeking him, there is a change. Jesus knows that in 40 days, he's going to ascend and return to the Father. This phase of his earthly ministry is drawing to an end. And in this very important and tender moment, he's reminding Mary of that. He's teaching Mary that. This part of the plan of salvation is over. I'm here to bear witness to the resurrection that everybody can see it. In seeing me, all those who believe can see the risen Christ, but things have changed. It's a different situation now. I'm ascending back to the place from which I came. And again, this, the phrasing of this here, very familiar in the gospel of John and what is proceeded to my father and to your father, to my God and your God, that concept of unity in the faith with our brother and savior, Jesus Christ, and our heavenly father as well. And what does Mary do? Mary goes and announced it to the disciples. I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. So again, Mary was there. She didn't leave. It would appear she didn't intend to leave unless she got to see him or was going to find him and, and, and give him a burial once again. She was there. She gets the first interaction with Jesus. And now, with that in mind, where are the disciples? And she had told them what had happened. And remember, this was at first light that she was there, that this happened. Now it's evening, and he's going to appear to the disciples. And, and pay attention to all of the details. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. All kinds of stuff in here. First of all, where are the disciples? They're hiding. They're hiding. They're behind locked doors because they're afraid of the Jews. And we know that Peter and John had gone to the, to the tomb. They had seen it empty. Imagine what that day, the conversation that went on as they were trying to figure things out, as they were talking about the possibilities. And from a human standpoint, it's good reason that they have that the doors are locked. What is to say now the Passover is over, the Sabbath is over. What's to say that the Jews aren't going to come and get them and stamp this Jesus thing out? All together. They're there in fear. You can say they're hiding, and fear is what defines what's going through their minds. And what does Jesus do? First of all, he appears, even though the doors are locked. It says it twice. When he appears in a week later, eight days later, and it's Thomas, the doors are locked. Jesus appears. The one who is God and man is now and and make no mistake make no mistake don't want to get really deep down into the christological rabbit hole here 
Jesus is still God and man. That didn't change after the resurrection. He shows them his hands and his side, saying, see, this is the Jesus, the man who was crucified on that cross. It is an important point. He is still man, and yet now he's allowing his no more humility, humility being that he held back his divine nature and didn't let that shine through except in exceptional moments like on the mountain of transfiguration. No more of that. He just appears in a locked room. Boom. He's there. Why? Because he's God and he can do that. And how he can be God, fully God and fully man, we don't know. We can't understand that, but the scriptures make it clear that that is the reality of the person of Jesus Christ. And this ascended, risen, victorious Lord appears to his disciples who were hiding in the upper room, and what is it he proclaims to them? Peace, peace. They didn't have peace there in that upper room all through that day as they talked and wrestled and mentally tried to grapple and come to to grips with what had transpired. Peace was the one thing that wasn't there. And the first thing he proclaims to them is peace. So important in the victory of life over death, in the victory of grace over sin, of Jesus over Satan, there is peace. It is the first thing he proclaims, peace. And if in my life I don't have peace, then I'm not appreciating everything that the resurrection teaches me. The depth of the love God has for me, the length to which he will go to take care of me, to save me, to protect me, to guard and shepherd me. If I don't have peace, then I'm not appreciating what the text is teaching us here today. And that's important. The more we understand and focus on, meditate on, appreciate, thank God for the resurrection and the victory that it brings to the degree that we do that, that peace that surpasses all understanding is going to be ours. So he shows them his hand and his side, and they were glad. And then Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Peace. And now, this is a precursor to the Great Commission. And John's going to tell us soon that everything Jesus did isn't written down. All that he did and after his resurrection isn't recorded. But this theme of peace, and then in that peace, he sends them out. As the guy said, this is the precursor to the Great Commission, go and make disciples. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. We are his body. We, The church is his body. He dwells in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. It is through us that his work continues. He was leaving. He was going back, ascending on high to sit at the right hand of God the Father and there to rule everything for the sake of his church, which is his body, which is described as his temple, and it is through us, the church, he sends us out to proclaim the word to others. He leaves, he sends us. We are in his place. And in that work, in that mission, We need to understand that peace that is ours. He's going to bless it. He's going to see it through. His word won't return to him empty. It's going to accomplish all the things that he intends for it. And that is the salvation of his children. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, and and I'll say this before we even read the text again, and this is where we're going to have to stop because we're we're running out of time here today. We'll get to Jesus and Thomas next week, which is when he appeared to him in relation to our text is next week. What Jesus says in verse 23 is very rarely dealt with by his church well. It is 
twisted and abused on one side and it is neglected for the most part on the other and there's very little use of it in between and it is important and this isn't the only place that he teaches it if you forgive he said receive the holy spirit he breathed on them the spirit wind spirit breath all those things connected he breathed on them the ones he was sending out and he said to them receive the holy spirit they're going to get the full manifestation in 50 days on the day of pentecost 10 days after his ascension but he is here bestowing on them the spirit and we start to see them come around receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them and if you withhold forgiveness from any it is withheld the church and it's usually carried out through the ministers of the church but the church all of us have this responsibility of forgiving sins and retaining sins if you withhold forgiveness from any it is withheld we don't get to do that willy-nilly how we see fit we do it in keeping with his word but it is important you can read the words of scripture and see that you are forgiven when it is proclaimed to you and that's what jesus here says to do proclaim that forgiveness if you forgive them they are forgiven and don't have time to go look at the other passages i will mention them it's in matthew 16 19 and matthew 18 18 there in the you are peter and on this rock and that's where a big branch of the church goes off in a in a direction that is not in keeping really fully with the text hearing forgiveness matters we operate we beings we human beings perceive the world we interact with our world through our senses and hearing is one of the most important hearing is key to communication and when we hear someone assure us be it a pastor or a fellow believer you're forgiven you're forgiven jesus died for your sins you're forgiven for those who are genuinely contrite over their sins not for those who say "Ah, i'm just going to go ahead and and do what i want say the forgiveness stuff and and it'll all be okay but i'm not going to change there isn't any true repentance in my life it is in those situations that jesus speaks of this if you withhold forgiveness from any it is withheld sometimes people need to hear you're on the road to hell you're continuing willfully in sin and to do so to continue in a path that is sinful that separates you from the forgiveness that christ rose from the dead to win for us and it's going to result in your spiritual harm and potentially in damnation as his body the church we as believers are charged with carrying this out and like i said the teaching is either it seems and this is probably stating it too harshly but it's either completely neglected or it's abused and turned into hoops you have to jump through to be forgiven and it's not the way christ intended it to be used we're going to have to stop here i thought we'd get through jesus appearing to thomas the next week we will pick that up next time and we will also talk about what john the author of this book says the purpose of the scriptures are about and in specific his gospel but it applies to all the scriptures and that's a very interesting section and we will cover that next time as well this is matthias 76 we appreciate you here at decoding the deception we pray that this teaching is a blessing to you and we that you pray for this ministry and the teaching that we do that it would go out to the strengthening and saving of souls we invite you to pray for this ministry support it go down there and give us a thumbs up make a comment share it with others help us to get this word out 
This is Matthias 76 together. We are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day. <music>